All right. For whatever reason, I kept things in this unit four. I think things do change to a different unit. So uh, watch Canvas to see if we are switching to the next unit because this is momentum and impulse. I've listed under Friday A day. We're going to do some notes together and then we've got some practice momentum and impulse. We'll go through the notes first, but let's give a little discussion about this momentum. This is a word we've heard of. We've probably used it and said, you know, oh man, I had a lot of momentum or that had a lot of momentum. But do we really know what that means? Do we know what is something that has momentum? Um, maybe. I mean, we can think about something that kind of keeps going and going. You're like, oh, it's got a little momentum that's carrying it. It's like, well, I've never seen like something with a little momentum on its shirt carrying something, but hey, you know, whatever works. Let's say that momentum is inertia in motion. Okay. If I was to define momentum, I would just simply call it inertia in motion. It's like, okay, why would you call it inertia in motion? It's like, what do we know about inertia? We know inertia, that's, um, man, that's like Newton's first law, because Newton said something about, let's see, his law of inertia, that's the first law. You know, an object in motion wants to stay in motion unless an external force. So we know external forces affect the motion. And I said it was an object, or I'm sorry, it was inertia in motion. Okay, so we've got that. Newton's second law was a force or sum of forces is mass times acceleration. So we know the sum of forces affect a mass and the acceleration. The, the forces really affect the acceleration because the mass is usually constant. An acceleration, that's like a change in velocity over time. Okay, so we, we have a foundation of forces, right? Newton's first and second laws. And we know Newton's first law, law of inertia, and we know the second law, F equals MA. And then an outside force can change an object's motion. And because momentum is about motion of an object, forces directly affect momentum changes. What does that mean? That's a good question. All right, let's take a look at this. Let me share my screen again. Let's go through some notes. Let's get some things written down so we've got something that we can refer back to when we remember that, oh yeah, we had school before the Thanksgiving break. What was that school? Who cares? That was before the break. All right, so I'm going to start with momentum. Momentum. Okay. And what did I say momentum was? Inertia in motion? Okay, well, we know inertia is simply mass. And we know motion can be measured based on velocity. Because if momentum is inertia in motion, if something isn't moving, it's not in motion. So if it's not moving, it's not inertia in motion. It's not a mass in motion. So that means it doesn't have momentum because by definition, it has to be in motion, I guess. So if we gave it a formula, for some reason, P is used. Now I can tell you the reason is because the Latin word for momentum starts with a P, okay? That's true. I was told that earlier today and I trust the source. So P equals M times V, mass times velocity, which comes from the definition. Not too bad at all. The unit, since it's mass times velocity, would be kilogram times meters per second. It makes sense because it's mass, kilograms, times velocity, which is meters per second. Now that we have that, let's take a look at a little bit where this comes from. We'll start with something that we know and we'll kind of just evolve it a bit. Uh, this is just a way to say, hey, you should be able to believe me. Is P momentum? Yes, P is momentum. I'm gonna scroll that back up. P is momentum and it's calculated by mass times velocity. We all know that the sum of forces equals mass times acceleration. I mean, even the on-level kids know this because we've all covered Newton's second law. If we remember that acceleration, even from circular motion, we were breaking acceleration out into what it is. Let's do that here. What is acceleration? It's a change of velocity over time. So I can say that the sum of forces equals mass times the change in velocity over time, right? Newton's second law. Okay, well, what is a change in velocity? Well, I'm glad you asked, right? So summation of forces is equal to mass times and uh, final velocity minus initial velocity, V minus V naught over time. We just said, hey, what is a change in velocity? Well, it's where I am minus where I came from. That tells me the change. Well, 
Awesome. Well, what if we go ahead and distribute that mass, right? If we take this mass and we multiply it in, we would get something like MV minus MV naught still over T, right? And what is MV? Well, that is P. And then M times V naught, that's P naught. Not P naught, but P naught, right? So we can say the summation of forces is equal to final momentum minus initial momentum over time. And we could abbreviate this by saying, well, that's just basically the change in momentum over time. Who likes fractions? I certainly don't. If we multiply both sides to get rid of the fraction, we would say the summation of forces times time equals a change in momentum. We can kind of abbreviate that and say, well, let's just say, how about force times time is equal to delta P or force times time is equal to mass times the change in velocity. Okay. Now this is a change in momentum. This isn't momentum. Now, how do we define that? Do we have a single word that would define all of this stuff? Yes, we do. Impulse. Impulse is a change in momentum. Okay. Impulse in a, in a um, formula, we would use the letter J as its designation. So we had P for momentum. So think momentum. We have a J for impulse. So think gym pulse. Okay, we have momentum and we have gym pulse. Easier way to recognize it when you look at the formula charts, it'll be like, oh yeah, I remember gym pulse and momentum. You may not remember it right now, but after the Thanksgiving break, you come back to the video, you look at it. It's like right now I'm talking to you. So everybody right now, they're like, we're ready for break. But just think for the few of you that go back and rewatch these, you're watching this thinking, oh, this is back when I was going into break. But you're watching it now and Thanksgiving is over. You've already had food. Your family's already come and gone, or maybe they didn't. You just did it all over Zoom. Or maybe most of your family lives in your house and then you're just like, I wish they would go away. Hey, whatever works, right? Everybody's situation is different. All right, so we have impulse is equal to, what do we say a change of um, momentum look like? That is force times time, or it's mass times the change in velocity. And here the unit, since it's force times time, that would be Newton seconds. I try to draw an S, but my S's always look like fives or fives look like, it's Newton seconds. That is our unit, Newton seconds. So here, all I want you to know from all of this talking for the last five minutes or whatever long it's been, forever, right? Momentum is mass in motion. It is P equals MV. Impulse is a change in momentum and is calculated as F times T or mass times the change in velocity. Which one do you use? What information are you given, right? It's our, it's our guess method over and over and over again. List out your given then look at your formulas and see what you can do with it. Okay. Same. Um, yes. Um, what is the uh, unit for impulse? I don't understand what you wrote. Oh, this is Newton seconds. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Because it's force times time, force is measured in Newtons, seconds are measured, I'm sorry, force is measured in Newtons, time is measured in seconds. So it'll be Newton seconds. Let's see. Is P momentum? Yes. Is impulse also equal to delta P over T? Well, let's go back delta P over T. Um, impulse wouldn't be equal to delta P over T because the T is divided to the other side. Um, force would be equal to delta P over T. So if we look at this right here, I'm looking at the chat and it's asking me, is impulse equal to delta P over T. Here we're gonna see where my arrow is on the screen. It says net force would be equal to delta P over T. So when we change um, time to the other side, we have FT is equal to delta P because delta P is a change in momentum and that's what impulse is, a change in momentum. Okay. And just make sure. 
Okay. If we've got that, we've gotten mo well, about halfway through the notes, then we have our practice problems. So let's see if I have enough room to scroll this up. Oh, look how much room I've got. That should work. I bet I can fit it all in here. Let's look at collisions, okay? Collisions, things running into each other. It doesn't have to be a car accident, though we do use car crashes or car impacts in order to describe it because this is something that we've seen on TV and movies, maybe experienced in real life. And I'm sorry if that is like a tough thing to think about. So I try to keep it lighthearted and talk about like intentional bumpings and um, like uh, bumper cars, things like that. So let's uh, focus on the good and not the bad. Um, here we've got collisions. I'm just going to title this um, collisions. And then I'm going to say conservation of momentum. Now, what does that mean? Collisions are things that hit each other. It could be me colliding with somebody in the hallway. It could be um, bumper cars at the state fair, if they ever open that back up, that sort of thing conservation of momentum, whatever momentum we have before the collision must be equal to whatever momentum we have after the collision. Just like energy, right? We conserved energy with the energy at the beginning is equal to energy at the end. Even if there's friction, that just means it's gone into another bucket called friction. Here's, we're going to sum up the, the momentum before. We know we can set it to momentum after. Momentum simply being mass times velocity summed up for all the objects in, that are in the situation or in play, okay? So let's take a look at this and see what all notes do I have on this. I have that I'm supposed to tell you, um, we use Newton's third law to determine the effect of the collision between two or more objects. So Newton's third law, remember that? Um, force pairs, so two objects, they share the same force. All right, let's stop the share for a second because that's an interesting topic. Okay, wow, so if it's two objects and they share the same force, okay, I've driven a truck before. I don't right now, but I've been in a truck and I've driven it. I've even driven a big U-Haul, okay? So imagine me driving a big box truck U-Haul. They weigh a ton, right? They're huge, They're, it's loaded down with all my furniture and I'm driving. So I've got a lot of mass and I'm cruising on down the highway and then there's this bug, okay? Let's say um, like a cicada, y'all know what cicadas are? They're the things that are really loud and there's sometimes when you get a flock of them, they get all over the parking lot. I drove through a parking lot with a lamp on the concrete and you can just hear them crunching under the tires, it's really gross. All right, so I'm driving along and I've got a lot of momentum, right? Um, I can hit something and I, it feels like it'd be a lot of force. So I'm driving with that U-Haul and I hit a cicada and it hits my windshield and splat cicada gone sorry if you love cicadas um cicada gone now who felt more force who experienced more force my u-haul truck or that cicada bug thing both had the same force both had the same force see i didn't trick her at all everybody else let's see shouldn't be the same according to third lot it is the same so in the chat yes it is the same and out loud, the brave one that was willing to stand out and say, I will answer this. Yes, absolutely, it's the same force. So it's got two things, they are sharing the same force. So if we can believe that, we can kind of take a look at different things and say, okay, when a collision happens, let's remember same force, okay? What about um, the time for the collision? The, would the time experience for the bug or the truck be the same or different? the same yes yeah, got to be the same right um so someone said what do i mean i mean there's only one collision so if i was to calculate the time that the um that was in the collision would it be different between the bug and the truck or the truck and the bug no it's the same collision so what does that mean didn't a minute ago didn't we say that impulse was force times time so if there is a change in momentum between the bug and the truck wouldn't that mean that they have the same impulse? Because we just said they would have the same force. We just said they would have the same time. So that means if two objects collide, they have the same impulse, right? Because it's force times time, they share the same force. That was Newton's third law. We learned that like forever ago. And we just recognized that, wait, it's the same collision. So there's only one time of the collision, time of that 
that that you know crashing into each other. So if there's only one collision, there's only one time. Newton said there's same force. So that means for anything in a collision, they have the same impulse. Okay, and then impulse is also known as what? Does anybody remember? Change in momentum. Change in momentum. So if you're asked, yes, and also in the chat, yes, if you are asked about a change in momentum, they are asking you about impulse. If they ask you about impulse, they are asking you about a change in moment, did I say that twice the same way? If they ask you about impulse, they're asking about change in momentum. If they ask about change in momentum, they're asking about impulse. And we know that it can be calculated to force times time or mass times the change in velocity, okay? And by understanding that, that means that the two objects involved in the collision are experiencing the same impulse. Is everything the same during a collision except for the masses of the two objects? No, the velocities could be different. We're gonna see that. The velocities can be different, um, but the impulses are gonna be the same. The, um, the momentums can be different, but if we add all the momentums available before the collision, and we add up all the momentums after the collision, those values should be the same, okay? So we're conserving momentum, and every object in that collision will experience the same impulse. What if there are multiple collisions? We'll look at each collision individually. So it's like, what if A hits B and then B hits A? Well, we've got a before and after the first collision, and then we have a before and after the second collision, if that were to occur. But don't worry, today we're gonna take it slow. The practice work is gonna explain itself. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna give you three like um, formulas for collisions. These aren't memorization formulas because I'm gonna write them because I know what happens in a collision so I can just write it out. But I hope that you'll be able to recognize what's going on and it's not gonna be difficult. And it ultimately, it's just add up the momentum before, make it equal to the momentum after. Let's see if we can do that in a way that just makes sense. And if we can, we'll do the practice work and we'll be out of here, okay? I promise this isn't that bad. This is not the thing that I want you to sweat. That'll come some other day, not today. All right, so let's go back to this. So collisions. There are going to be three types of collisions I want to talk about. The first one is, what is it? Elastic. See, I'm going to cheat and look at my notes. All right, so an elastic collision. E Elastic. Okay. This is when something hits and bounces off. Okay. Um, if there's a car to a stop sign and you're a new driver and you're not paying attention and you're slowing down, but not slowing down fast enough. And you bump that car in front of you, you come to the stop and that car keeps going or think of billiards. You guys ever play pool? You ever like hit, you hit one ball, like you hit the cue ball, the cue ball hits the, let's say eight ball and the cue ball sometimes will stop and the eight ball will keep going. So that's a transfer of momentum. The momentum before all came from the cue ball. The momentum after was all relevant in the eight ball. So um, billiards or pool, like a pool table, is perfect for um, collisions because here you can see things happen like that. So an elastic is bouncing off. You know, one thing hits one thing and then it bounces off, okay? So the way that we would look at that is, is we're gonna say the mass of A plus the, vol I'm sorry, times, I need to focus a little bit better. Mass of A times the velocity of A. This would be like the cue ball, right? It's mass and its velocity, which would be its momentum, plus the mass of B times the velocity of B, okay? Equals. This is the ball that the cue ball is gonna hit, all right? In this case, there's only one collision, let's keep it simple. The eight ball is right there by the corner pocket. We're on the last ball we call corner pocket and we line it up, we hit the cue ball, cue ball's going. Before the collision, only the cue ball has velocity. The eight ball is not moving. So we've got the momentum of the cue ball plus zero momentum of the eight ball because no velocity, no momentum. So we're gonna say is equal to, now I'm gonna put this little imaginary dash line, okay? You don't have to draw that. I just wanna show you that this is the before and on the other side of the dash is the after, okay? All right, don't feel like you have to do the, da the dash because it might mess you up later, that dotted line. I just wanna say, hey, what I get from before is equal to what I get after. What I get after would be simply, since they bounce off of each other, I'm gonna say the mass of A times the velocity of A, and I'm gonna say prime, okay? That little one in the top right corner, that just means the final momentum. You know, before we would say initial would all be about the little nod, like uh, V naught, 
Well, if I was doing knots right now, you'd see like VA knot. That's too many subscripts. So just allow me to put a postscript, a prime to say, this is after, okay? Meaning that the velocity has changed, but it still applies for the A ball. Okay, if you accept that, we're cool. And then I would say plus M B times V B prime. This is, I add up the momentum of the separate balls before, I add up the momentum of the separate balls after, those two summations should be equal to each other. That's it. I told you this isn't that hard. It's simply what do you have before is equal to what you have after, right? Not bad at all. If it's bad, that's okay. It's the first day. Plus we're going into break and it's Friday and it's gorgeous out. You guys have windows, I'm sure. I have no windows in here, so I don't even get to enjoy the sunshine, but poor me, right? But they pay me to be here, so there you go. All right, now we've got perfectly, perfect. Perfect. See, I misspelled perfect. How about that? I put perfect. There is an R in that word. Perfectly inelastic. Perfectly inelastic, they stick together. All right. Here you can think about trains, right? You got one train car and you have another train car. And in order for them to join them together, they ram them into each other and the coupling unit will come in, crash into each other and then couples, right? So before the, the collision, there are two separate masses. After the collision, it's one big mass because they're joined up. Okay, you can think of an, a car accident um, where the bumpers get locked together and they're stuck together, right? That would be kind of a bad accident. So here, if we have perfectly inelastic, we would start out the same way, right? We would have MA times VA plus MB times VB just the mass of A times the velocity of A, which is momentum, plus the mass of B times the velocity of B, which is momentum of B, all right? Now is equal to, let's bring these dots down so we can say is, that's our after. Well, now they're stuck together. We have one big mass, right? One big mass. What would that look like? That would be MA plus MB. And then they would have a shared velocity because they're connected. If they're connected, they can't have different velocities. They're connected. So that'd be times velocity prime. All right, let me catch up with this. Wouldn't Newton's cradle be a good example of elastic collisions? Could be. So this one is where two objects come together after a collision, right? Yes. Is this one on the formula chart? Oh, I don't think so. I honestly don't think that this is on the formula chart. Um, but once you've, once you've done this, like today, don't worry about memorizing. Once you do this a little bit, honestly, this is not something I memorize. This is just something when you understand, you can come up with it. You can completely come up with this and say, oh, I've got two separate objects. Okay, momentum plus momentum. And then what happens? Are they going to stick or not? Oh, they stick? Okay, so then I have momentum of one object. Or do they bounce? Oh, I've got momentum plus momentum, right? That's all it is. And when I show you the third one, you're gonna be like, oh, okay, it's not even like the third one because the third one is number two flipped over. What does that mean? Let me show you, all right? The third one is explosion. And by explosion, I don't mean like fertilizer in a truck, people getting hurt, I'm talking about firecrackers, okay? Everybody likes a nice firecracker, you put it on the ground, it goes pop, right? Okay. So with firecrackers, we're gonna say it starts as one big object, MA plus M b times the velocity okay that's going to be equal to m a times v a prime plus m b times v b prime okay what does that mean that means if i put a firecracker on the ground and i light it and it pops whatever momentum i have going to the left must be equal to whatever momentum I have going to the right. It was not moving at first. That means there was no momentum before it popped. But after it popped, I have an equal amount of momentum going in a negative direction as I have going in a positive direction. And when you add that all up, that equals zero because momentum before equals momentum after. If I carry my little dotted lines down, I can say, hey, my before equals my after. You can see that perfectly inelastic and explosion are flips of each other. So when two objects split up after collision, 
this um, so explosion is you have one object that splits because of a collision, yes, or an explosion like a firecracker. It was one object, and then the the collision or explosion or whatever you want to say, something happened to make it into more than one object, either two or infinite. But if you add up all going to the negative side and then add up all going to the positive side, it will balance. Here, we're not gonna talk about center of gravity today, but if you can imagine what would center of gravity be, it'd be the center of the object. If the center of the object is not moving, after the explosion, if you were to calculate all of the momentum, the center of object would still be at the same location. If you were to take that firecracker and throw it in the air before it pops and it's moving through the air at 10 meters per second and it pops, the if you looked at the momentum of the um, particles coming away from that firecracker, you would see that the center of that um, uh, the center of mass which should still be propelled at 10 meters per second going outward the same way it was before the crash all of it's still going out and then explodes still going out okay that's what i'm alluding to here okay hopefully you've had enough time to kind of catch up with those formulas enjoyed the discussion about it because i want it to be somewhat entertaining so it's worth at least listening to so i want to give you a a Kind of a, a trivia question and then we're going to go into the um the assignment so this is your trivia question okay a butterfly and a 18 wheeler when can they have the same momentum and keep in mind don't say well the butterfly is really low mass compared to the 18 wheeler so let's imagine the butterfly is going super fast all right butterflies are delicate they can't go super fast without you know tearing to pieces don't tear my butterfly to pieces so tell me, when can a butterfly and a Mack truck have the same momentum? Come on, this is an on-level question. I asked this in the on-level presentation. If the truck is going really slow. Okay, so if the truck's going really slow, the butterfly still has to overcome the mass of the truck. So <laughs> if, the, if the truck is like a million times more massive than the butterfly, and if the if the truck's going really slow, we would still have to have the butterfly to have a million times that velocity just to balance it out. Uh, when the butterfly's velocity is equal to the truck's mass and the truck's velocity is equal to the butterfly's mass. But that's true, but the butterfly would not survive the velocity of the truck's mass. Is it if they have a perfectly inelastic collision? Even if they had an, even if they were stuck together, they would be going the same velocity, but they're different. I'm still saying they still have different masses, okay? It's still the butterfly and the truck, even if they're stuck together, how would that butterfly have the same momentum? I'm still looking for that perfect answer. When they're both still. Oh, say that louder. When they're both still. And what does still mean? What's the velocity equal to? Zero. Zero. Okay. So what he said was, is what if the velocity was zero? If the velocity is zero, what is the momentum? Zero. Zero. So if they're both sitting still, they both have a momentum of zero. That was a tricky little question, wasn't it? All right, that's what I want you to think about when you get to these questions and when you're thinking about these topics. I want you to be able to not just think about, oh, I have to use this formula. You need to think about all the way around the problem. It's like, well, they both could have a momentum of zero. If they're both in the parking lot, just chilling in the sun, truck, butterfly, not moving, no momentum, they are equal. All right, that's just a fun question we pose to the on-level class. Right after we define momentum, usually someone will come up with it, it takes a little bit of a struggle, but that's just something we wanna think about as we're going through these. We've gotta think a little bit more in depth, right? I teach you at a certain level, then I make you practice at a higher level, and then we test you what feels like even a higher level sometimes until we explain the test, and then you're like, oh, is that all, right? Exactly. Makes you wish you came to more tutorials. I know, that's cool. All right, so let's go back and let's do this practice sheet together. We get through the majority of this and I'll cut some of it down because some of it's really silly. I wanna get us to what's important, okay? Um, let's de determine what is important. So this says, which of the letters show negative force? Okay, Do um, tell me what letters in this graph show negative force? You gotta use words. C, D, and E. All right. Um, can I pick on you? Sure. All right. Tell me, what is the force for C? 
Oh, sorry, it's six meters. Wait, is there's, that positive or negative? There's no points on this graph. There are no points on this graph. There's a negative change of force, but there's no actual negative force. Right, there's a reduction of force, but there's no negative forces, right? Trick question, isn't it? So make sure that make sure that when we're looking at these things, now don't be shy about answering because I appreciate the fact that um, there's enough of you that are willing to speak out. And I wanna tell you those that speak out are gonna do better overall because you're engaging and you're putting it out there right in front of 35 of your peers, you're willing to say something right or wrong. But when we're looking at this graph, the graph starts at zero and goes up to 12. All right, this graph goes from zero to 12. So we know there's no negative force. Yes, it does go more positive. It stays constant and then it goes down, but it never goes below the zero. So that takes care of a lot of the questions on this. So let's go down to, um, what about F? From three to 12 seconds, does the object speed up or slow down? Does it speed up or slow down from three to 12 seconds? Does it speed up? Why does it speed up? Because the acceleration, um, like it's not a changing acceleration, like the velocity is not constant. Correct. The velocity is not constant because we have a force. We have an right. unbalanced force of eight newtons, so we know we're speeding up. What about from 12 to 18 seconds? Are we speeding up or slowing down? It's still speeding up, but at a slower rate because there's still a positive yeah. net force. Right. Remember that from the quiz or test or whatever that was a, a, a couple of days ago, or a couple of classes ago? There is still a positive net force, so we're still accelerating just at a lower rate, but it is still increasing velocity. It is still increasing velocity. All right, H says, uh, calculate the change in momentum from zero to 18 seconds. Change in momentum equals what? What did I say? There's a one word answer here. What is change in momentum? Impulse. Yeah, impulse. So we know change in momentum is impulse. And we know that, so change in momentum here, I wanna draw on this now. I wanna say that this is impulse. And we know that impulse is equal to force times time and it's equal to mass times delta V. Well, they didn't tell us the mass or delta V, but they, we have graph for force times time. And in the graph, if, it, if we were multiplying the two axes, then we're gonna look at the area under the curve. That would be this triangle, this rectangle, and then this triangle, which amounts to, if I was to calculate this off to the side, I would say that this is one half times base times height, which would be three times eight. That's the first triangle, because it's one half the base times the height, it's a triangle. Then it's the, then I'm gonna add the rectangle to that, which is from three to 12, which is um, 12 minus three is nine, and I'm still going eight tall. So nine times eight. And then I wanna add that last triangle, I'm going from 12 to 18, which would be six wide, eight tall. So we have one half times six times eight. Okay. If I got any of those numbers wrong, let me know. I'm trying to do this a little bit fast. So if I make a mistake, you can totally call me on it. I appreciate it. But when I did this math, I got 108 Newton seconds because that's my, um, my unit, 108. And that is for this problem right here. Let me draw this arrow. Okay. Area under the curve because it's, force times time. It's in the formula. Now the next question says, if a five kilogram object was moving 2.5 meters per second before the impulse, calculate its final velocity. Whoa, that's heavy. Okay, we can do this. We can totally do this. We know that impulse is equal to not just force times time, but it's equal to mass times the change in velocity, meaning that impulse is equal to mass times final velocity minus initial velocity, right? And in the last problem, didn't we calculate impulse? Don't we know the impulse is 1.8? We kind of do because it was, we saw for change in, imp, uh, change in momentum, which is impulse. So we know it's 108. So we know 108 is equal to the mass, they said five, times um, they said we're looking for final velocity, so it would be V minus the initial 2.5. Okay. 
Here, we can distribute that five into the parentheses. We'd have 108 is equal to 5V minus five times two and a half. We get some number. We would solve for V. If you were to math this, calculate it out, I would say that you're probably going to get 24.1 meters per second. Okay. This is the type of problem that you want to be familiar with that you want to be able to understand that we were able to get impulse from a graph, that we know it's force times time, that we know it's mass times a change in velocity and be flexible with that. Now, do I expect you to be totally comfortable with it today? Heck no. I expect you to be present today and write something down. If you're doing that, you're on path, all right? You're on track, no big expectations today. I'm gonna to scroll this up just so we can see what's going on below this. Here it gives us some change in velocities of an object. First it's going down, then it's going up. And it wants us to calculate the change in momentum. We know change in momentum as impulse. Here they did not give us a force, they did not give us a time. So they must want us to use mass and a change in velocity. Well, the initial velocity for the first one, the V naught equals negative 12 meters per second. I can see that because it's going down, but then it's going up. So the final velocity would equal 10 meters per second. That means that the impulse would be 48 times final 10 minus initial negative 12. Yes, 10 minus negative 12 is 10 plus 12. I know that. But I want to make sure when someone looks up, they're like, wait a minute, why'd you add those together? What? I want you to be able to understand that it's final minus initial. 10 minus negative 12. Okay. When we calculate that, put a little math to it, I think we should get 1056. Let's do, let's say the first and the third one. So you have those examples. I'll leave the second and fourth for you to look at. Fair? Fair. All right, initial equals negative 20 meters per second. Because it's going down, I'm calling down negative, up positive. All right, final is equal to 20 meters per second. So we know that it's mass times the change. The mass is 16 times 20 minus negative 20. 20 minus negative 20 is 40. 40 times 16 is some number. You can calculate it. I have faith you know how to subtract the negative number and then hit the multiply key on your keyboard or calculator, phone, whatever you're using. All right, that's the simple stuff. Let's look at a question that's actually shows us what's going on. Yes, I'm gonna go past 345 mark, but I promise you I won't go past the four o'clock mark. Promise you. I'm gonna scroll this up because I have faith that we are on track. All right, I'm gonna look at number three. Number three, two cars collide and stick together upon impact. First car has a mass of 1,000, moving at 20 meters per second. Second car has a mass of 1,500 and was stopped. Let's draw the picture. We've got a 1,000 kilogram car, 1,000 kilograms moving at 20 meters per second. We've got another car, 1,500. I'm not gonna put the kg in and it's currently not moving. All right, that's before the collision. After the collision, they are now stuck together, which would be a 2,500 kilogram pileup and it's moving at eight meters per second. So we've just drawn the picture, right? Two things collide. The first one slows down, the, first one, the second one speeds up, but together they're stuck together. They're moving at eight meters per second. So now unmute and tell me which car experienced the greatest force? Which car? What's they that? Had the same. The same, the same force. Remember Newton's third law. Good old Newton, third law. Third law equals the same. Which car experienced the greatest change in momentum? Who remembers this from like 10 minutes ago? Still the same. Still the same. Change in momentum is Jim Pulse, which equals force times time. They have the same force, they have the same time. So they have the same change in momentum. What was the impulse experienced by each car? Now we need to calculate something, okay? They didn't give us the force, they didn't give us the time. That means we have to use mass times the change in velocity. Let's call the smaller car, car one, and the second one, car two. 
So for car one, we're going to say it's the mass of 1000 times the change in velocity. The final velocity is eight, and we're going to subtract the initial velocity of 20. So 20, uh, eight minus 20 should be like negative 12. Negative 12 times 1,000 would be equal to negative 12,000. For car number two, the mass is 1,500. The final velocity is eight. The initial velocity is zero. Eight minus zero is eight. Eight times 15 equals 12,000. Imagine that. We have calculated the impulse and they have the same magnitude, just different directions. Right, one car, when they impacted their acceleration was to the, the one that was moving 20 meters per second, it slowed down, so its acceleration was negative. The one that wasn't moving and then started moving at eight meters per second, its acceleration was positive. So we can see that their accelerations are in different directions. We see that they have the same impulse, even if it's one's positive, one's negative, that just is directional, right? Who cares about direction? What was the magnitude? 12,000. If the collision took place over a 0.5 seconds, what was the force experienced by each car? Okay, well, we know the impulse was 12,000. And that's equal to force times time. So we would say 12,000 is equal to force times 0 0.5. Divide both sides by 0 0.5, we should get 24,000 newtons is equal to the force because we've just solved for the impulse and we know impulse is 12,000, but we know impulse is force times time. So we just set it equal to force times time. Again, if this is over your head, don't worry. It's the first day. And this is the, this will be the recording that goes up on Zoom. So you're like, I can relive this over and over. Can I really, I'm so excited. Yes, I know you're saying that. No, you're not saying that, but hey, I can wish. If the collision took place over 0.5 seconds, what was the acceleration of each car? Well, we can do this. We know that force equals mass times acceleration. So for car one, we've got 24,000 is equal to the mass 1,000 times A. 24,000 divided by 1,000 should be 24 meters per second squared is equal to acceleration. For car two, we have what, 24,000, 24,000 is equal to the mass 1500 times A. Um, 24,000 divided by 1500, ooh, I've got to do that. 24, one, two, three, divided by 15, one, two, 16. 16 meters per second square is equal to A. Now we must recognize they're in different directions. The Acceleration of car one was to the left, acceleration of car two was to the right. We can see that through the image, the way that I drew it. But they do have different accelerations, bigger mass, less acceleration, because it's the same force. Bigger mass, less acceleration. Think about that bug I talked about earlier. When the when the U-Haul truck hits the cicada bug, the truck is big mass, so it's gonna have a very little acceleration change. The bug, tiny mass, very big acceleration change so that mass times acceleration is equal for both. Oh, never mind. Okay, cool. All right, that's the end of page one. Let's scoot on over to page two. Let's see what's important here. I think we can hit the highlights and still be done by four o'clock. That is the dream, and we are living the dream here, right? Two eggs, they give us the mass or drop from the top of a 20 meter high building. Each hit the ground with the same velocity and stops. Well, that's normally what happens when you drop an egg. What is the velocity of each egg before it hits the ground? Well, we know that mgh is equal to one half mv squared, meaning that the gravitational potential at the top is equal to the kinetic energy at the bottom. Masses do cancel out, bam, bam. Gravity is 10 times height they told us is 20 is equal to one half times velocity squared. Um, let's see, 10 times 20 is 200. Multiply both sides by two. So you get 400 is equal to V square. I want V, so I square root it. I end up with um, 20 is equal to V, 20 meters per second. Try to fit that in there. 20 meters per second is my velocity before it hits the ground. What is the change in momentum of each egg? 
okay, well, the change in momentum is impulse. Impulse is equal to force times time is equal to mass times change in velocity. Well, they didn't give me a force or a time, so I'm gonna use the second half, mass times change in velocity. Mass is 0 0.25 times, let's see, the final velocity is 20. The initial velocity, they said dropped, so we know the initial velocity is zero. 20 minus zero, still 20. 20 times 0.25 should be five. Yeah, I think so. So five Newton seconds is the change in momentum. All right, what's the impulse? Can someone calculate that for me really quick? What's the impulse? Five Newton seconds. Five Newton seconds. Caleb, you win the, you win the prize, the fastest one on the mic. Because impulse is change in momentum. If we've calculated change in momentum, we've calculated the impulse. It's the same thing. Same thing. All right, let's see if there's anything important here. The first egg hits the ground and stops in 0.002 seconds. The other egg is protected by a drinking straw scaffold and stops over time at 0.05 seconds. We do this in, um, in on level. We build these scaffolds for eggs and we drop them and if they break, they fail. If they drop them from shoulder length and they, and they break, that's failing grade. It's sad because they don't get to try it beforehand. But if they can drop it over the banister out here in the hallway down to the first floor and it doesn't break, they get a hundred. Talk about a dramatic day in class. You can go from a failing grade to a hundred percent just based on a stupid egg that you don't get to have until I hand it to you and say, let's go. I know it's, it's awesome for me. It's miserable for some of them. And what's crazy is it's usually like the really brainiacs in class that get everything right. Their eggs break. And the kids that are just like, whatever, I'm gonna put this together at the last second. There's just work everywhere and it drives the hardworking kids crazy. And it's awesome to do right, like right before a break. So that way they're all stressed out and then we're like, okay, but you don't have to come back for a week. So see you later. I know I'm mean, it's craziness. All right, the first egg hits the ground and stops, blah, blah, blah. Let's see, what is the average stopping force experienced by each egg? Well, we know that um, impulse is equal to force times time, right? And we said the impulse is five equals force that we want times time that they give us 0 0.002. And then we have another one that's gonna be five is equal to force times 0 0.05. All right, so then what's the force of the first one? Let me get my handy little calculator. Five divided by 0 0.02, 2,500 Newtons of force for the first one. The one that's in the scaffolding, five divided by 0 0.05 is 100. Newtons of, is the force. So just by putting a little scaffolding on this egg and changing the time from 0 0.002 seconds to 0 0.05 seconds, look how much the force is affected. See how the force is way less? Because as the time goes up, the force has to go down because the impulse is the same. The impulse is not going to change. It's still going from 20 meters per second, right before it hits the ground, to zero. Eventually, the egg's going to stop. So our change in velocity was going to be 20 meters per second, right before it hits the ground, to zero. So impulse is the same. Now, if you can extend the time to the stop, it's easier. Um, okay, yeah, thank you for letting me know. It's totally okay, and they can always, he can always check out the recording. That's totally cool. Um, so let's talk about this for just a second. Let me see if there's anything that's important here. No, because I can do this all through discussion. Okay, so let me ask you this. This is a, um, a rhetorical question, meaning don't answer it because it's just like for you to think about. Why do we have airbags in cars? It's like, well, it save lives. Why do they save lives? Because it's a cushion. No, it's, it's not for a cushion. If you ever been hit by an airbag, it hurts, okay? It slaps you right in the face, the side of the head, if it's a side curtain airbag. They hurt, but what do they really do? Okay, what they really, oh, hold on, there's some words coming in, let's see. Oh, no, no, yeah, somebody, co somebody covered you. They totally told me what's going on with your Zoom. Glad you're back, because this is pseudo important. What an airbag does is this, you you're coming to a stop, an abrupt stop, like there's a traffic accident happening. You come to a hard stop, if there's no airbag there, your body's gonna come forward, hit the steering wheel, right? You're gonna come to a very abrupt stop. There's nothing stopping you. Maybe your seatbelt <clears throat> hurts, right? Now, imagine an airbag that comes out. 
and that when it comes out, it's it relatively slowly deflates. So I can either go boom against the against the side window or the steering wheel, or I can have an airbag that comes out and instead of me going bam, I go slower. And what did it just do? It increased the time it took for my body to stop. By increasing the time it took for my body to stop, the force is less. And that's why we have airbags. So anytime you can increase the time of the impulse, you are decreasing the force. I'll give you one last example, one that we've all experienced. You've been in a car. You've been in a car with your parent driving or whoever driving and they've slammed on their brakes and you lunge forward and you're like, dude, you made me spill my fries, right? You don't want to spill fries because when you vacuum the car up, there's always that one fry you couldn't find. I don't care how often you vacuum your car. There's always that one fry. You know what I'm talking about. All right. Now, what about the times that you see the red light way up ahead and you get off the gas, you coast. And then as you approach the, the area, you're like, this is a long red light. I'm not even going to try to race this light. And then you just ease on the brake. And you just come to a very slow, subtle, soft stop. You never lunge forward. Both times you went from 45 miles per hour to zero, didn't you? So the impulse is the same. The impulse is the exact same. The mass of the car, same. The velocity, 45 to zero, same. The difference is, is how much time did you take to stop? If you decrease the time, the force goes up. If you can increase the time, the force goes down and everybody's happier. That is today's talk on force mass acceleration but really it's about collisions with momentum and impulse thanks for sharing just kidding i hope you guys have an absolutely great break